Today, we're talking about navigating the changes or changes in the multifamily investment market. Uh, we've got some great guests, which we'll get to in a second. Um, a couple of quick housekeeping notes here. Um, but as with all of our webinars, the nothing here should be taken or construed as legal advice. Today, obviously, we're talking more about market sector and um, getting some great insight from professionals in the space. So less likely to see legal advice, but uh, we remind you that you should seek an attorney for anything illegally related or any specific issues you have. Um, and you can follow us on the following, on, on this uh, little information list serve here. Uh, this is being recorded. So if you find it helpful, you can check us out on YouTube. We have a little channel there with all the past videos. There's a lot of insightful information there. If your friends or colleagues or family want to have a look there. If you need anything, we'll be posting the email addresses of the guests. Love to have you reach out directly. As always, want to be a resource for you. Um, with that, we're going to start into this, um, but go ahead and um, ask questions in the questions uh, chat area, and we'll try to address those as, as we go through. Um, we are super fortunate to have a great relationship with Cushman Wakefield, and particularly over the last two decades of his commercial brokerage career, managing director Tim McKay has spent uh, the bulk of his professional career uh, uh, as a multifamily broker in the greater Seattle area. Uh, there are a lot of brokers that uh, Humphreys and Gardner has the opportunity to work with. Uh, Tim would be among those that are trusted and uh, always acting in good faith and consistently a resource, even if he doesn't have any interest in the deal, uh, which is something that we always try to look for in folks that are just going to be givers in the community uh, and that they know what they're talking about. So um, we really appreciate Tim being on. We also have Chris Moyer. Uh, Chris is Executive Managing Director in uh, Cushman Wakefield's Equity, Debt, and Structured Finance Department. He raises debt and equity for all kinds of assets, very familiar with the capital situation or side of the equation. He has worked on more than 130 transactions and raised approximately $20 billion since starting at um, Cushman and Wakefield in 2006. He was based in New York City now. He splits his time between here and Seattle. He's done a bunch of really impressive and notable projects in this area, um, including structuring work, um, temporary developments work, and um, uh, a number of high, high, high dollar figures on uh, projects in Seattle. First, um, first light at 30 Virginia, 450 condo units and 100,000 square feet of spec office. So uh, suffice to say, Chris comes equipped on the capital side in a way I'm not familiar with other folks in, in, in our area that have that. So uh, welcome, guys, and thank you for joining us today. Happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Thanks so much. Good to be back. <laughs> so, um, as noted, you can use the Q&A feature uh, to get going on stuff. But, you know, what we'd like to do is start um, Tim and Chris off by uh, they have some presentation materials that will go through and give us the market update and also give us a little a bit of a, uh, uh, a sharing experience on what what types of deals they're working on right now. So with that, I'll turn it over to them and then we'll go into sort of a discussion on a few questions I had. So we'll, we, I don't want to spend too much time going through the slides, but we'll just give some background and send this around and any questions people have, we'll, we'll uh, certainly follow up with. So uh, can you go to the next slide, please. And obviously all this stuff is changing rapidly. And so we'll try and give you some context along with what's been put together. Cause I feel like as soon as we put this stuff together, it's often the next day, it might be different. Yeah. So, so when this was prepared like 48 hours ago, this, this was relevant, <laughs> but was, um, something may have changed today. So, yeah. so I, I think just, you know, we're, we're seeing healthy demand um, for, for housing, right? We're, we're kind of in the high 200,000 units annually required uh, year to day. We've seen some, some pretty healthy demand on that. I think that the concern that uh, generally the market has is around construction right now, because there was a lot of construction starts over the last few years. And, um, you know, it's, it's continuing to outpace uh, that demand. So we have supply and demand on the right side. So we're seeing a, a push up in vacancy to about uh, you know 8% nationally with, within this past year as a result of a lot of that imbalance uh, over the last few years, uh, you know, supply in, in, in the last basically, uh, you know, six to eight quarters. Uh, next slide. Um, so, so Cushman Wakefield, if, if you're not familiar, has uh, it owns Pinnacle, which uh, manages, I think, about 174,000 multifamily units around the country. So we have some pretty good uh, intel on, on property performance. Always think of us as a resource if you need us to look at expenses or, or, or comps, et cetera. We, we can work with our property management team to pull that. Um, so, so this is data that shows the applications for apartments um, just within the Cushman portfolio over the last uh, about 18 months. 
And you know, we're, we're still at you know above where we were in August of 22. Um, we're seeing a little bit of a downturn seasonality kind of coming out of uh, the, the summer months. Uh, but but overall, good application data coming into apartments. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, Tim. I'll just say, and what this tells us right now is, is the construction pipeline is generally 18 to call it 30 months to get something built and open. So um, the ramp up, kind of the max you saw around Q2 in 2023, where things topped out, were projects that uh, broke ground in 2021 and probably were applied for somewhere in 2020, 2019. And so we're going to see this continue to dip down. We'll get into that more with um, the supply later in this, but as you're going to see is this is plateaued and this is going to continue to go down for the foreseeable future. Uh, next, next slide. So uh, this, you know, one of the things that's keeping uh, renters in their apartments is that the single family market is completely broken. Um, you know, San Jose, Silicon Valley at the top of the list, most expensive market in the country, uh, you know, $1,300 a month year over year, single family home ownership costs. Uh, Seattle towards the uh, the top here, kind of in that uh, pu pushing upwards of uh, eight hundred dollars a month change uh, year over year. So keeping people in housing longer with uh, with interest rates up and, and increasing uh, home ownership cost. Uh, next slide, please. So so this has put uh, certainly a lot of pressure uh, on occupancy, uh, which is the uh, the left hand side chart. So we're we're seeing uh, twenty three or sorry that that's. Um, that's uh, rent growth. Sorry. Uh, so, so if the, the the blue dotted line is showing the rent growth in this past year, so so not a lot of um, pre pressure on rent growth, uh, especially down significantly from last year and, and way down from twenty one, we saw a lot of pressure upwards. Uh, lease trade outs uh, dropped off uh, significantly. I, I heard uh, um, gain to lease used on a couple calls with owners today. I know we were throwing a lot lost to lease around for so long, but we're seeing you know lease trade outs certainly trending down drastically because of the pressure on rents and uh, you know, OPEX is, is challenging for a lot of owners. So we're seeing, you know, NLI starting to, to plateau and struggle uh, with, with kind of these confounding factors on, on both the revenue and expense side. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add that we've seen expense uh, insurance, obviously that's <laughs> the top of the chart here in increase here, year over year uh, expenses. Insurance up in the Northwest is, has probably doubled in the last five to seven years. Down in California, Texas, you're up like five X in the last five years and down in Florida, in some of those Sunbelt states, it's up almost 10x. So while it's been a pinch up here in the Northwest, um, we've actually missed and are probably paying for a lot of the issues that we're seeing in the southern part of the U.S. So that's something to keep an eye on because it doesn't seem like there's a lot of relief in sight on that end. Now, next slide. So uh, construction, that, you know, that, that's what's putting a lot of the pressure on the market right now. A lot of these deliveries have started in the last uh, you know, 24 months uh, when, when, we all, when there used to be a lot of money floating around, a lot more money floating around. Um, I, I, I really like this chart and you know, everybody can take a look at it when we send around the deck after the call. But th this highlights, um, and instead of just looking at supply as a percentage, which a lot of people do, this looks at supply based on years of construction um, using the units under construction divided by the annual demand to so basically look at what the absorption would need to be um, on, on these projects. So, um, you, you know, Seattle, I think, is sort of at a healthy level. It's Seattle sort of being built to like three years of uh, average demand right now. So, so when you think about that number of units in the pipeline and units taking about 30 to 36 months, that kind of feels like you're building to a level and, and with, with modest growth in the market to kind of absorb that. Um, I, I think we see a lot more growth opportunity in Seattle than a lot of other markets. So I think that, that, that it's it's sort of at the upper end to imbalance right now. Um, certainly not uh, in, in a scary position, but not not in the ideal position that you'd like it to be from a supply demand balance at this point. And, and Seattle led the nation in apartments coming online for three or four years in a row. And so we've it, 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 this may look like a step back or feel like it, depending on what you read in the, you know read in the Seattle Times. Uh, or in the news, but uh, this is actually just a return to a healthy level. And what we're going to see um, as we go forward is Seattle specifically, but I'm sure this is affecting a lot of other markets, is uh, um, these starts are going to fall off dramatically. Uh, there's an article in the Seattle Times today about, or the Business Journal today, excuse me, about how only 43 units or 4,300 units are currently under construction in the Seattle area, which is roughly half of what we had uh, at any time over the last 12 years. So it's at its lowest level in the last 12 years. Uh, due to constraints in uh, the debt markets, the equity markets, construction costs, and we'll continue to see that fall off. So um, while we're at kind of a healthy level now, uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see this fall down to about half of what it is next year and the year after that, which will lead to rent growth. So that's something to keep an eye on because that's going to be a real driver in the market. 
Okay, go to the next slide. And and I, and I think this is this is kind of what Tim was basically leading into, is that you know, construction starts. We had this massive, massive uh, construction starts that happened in in, in late 2021 20, when when capital was really flowing, right? Rents were jumping. Um, but but given the constraints of capital markets, like the the, su the supply is falling off drastically, right? The deliveries are are, are going to be you know way down for, from where we've seen them in 23, 24 is falling off, twenty six is is really non existent at this point because it, it's very hard to capitalize any construction deals right now. So so this is where we're going to see a lot of uh, we're expecting to see a lot of rent growth and some of those outer years um, as as the supply is absorbed. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, Tim, do you want to talk about the the investment sales market? Uh, yeah, I mean, investment sales uh, since we came out of COVID was essentially driven by uh, interest rates. I mean, I think values were uh, inflated artificially. Um, you know, coming out of 2019, uh, rates dropped. 2020 was a tough year as everyone kind of figured out what they were doing. Um, you'll notice 2021, uh, 20, uh, the red line there shoots through the roof, and that's everyone trying to get projects done. Uh, they didn't spend money or, or trade, or, you know, during the middle of COVID in 2020, and then they they took their they seized on their opportunity to transact. Uh, 2022 starts to fall off towards October, November, December as interest rates started to climb, and then you'll see that sad orange line at the bottom, which is which equates to just the fact that it's a lot harder to transact when interest rates are double what they were 18 months ago. So that's something we're really keen on. There's a lot of money sitting on the side. Um, you know, Chris and I talk almost daily. Uh, about trying to find ways to put deals together for clients who want to transact, but uh, interest rates have been the biggest burden on all that. Um, and uh, there's some, you know, Sunbelt in the, in the Sunbelt is still the most popular place to invest. Um, you know, there's so many people moving down to that area. So you'll see on that far right slide that the Sunbelt still outpacing the rest of the country for now, but I wouldn't be surprised over the next couple of years to see the West uh, return and become um, the top investment market in the country. And uh, next slide, please. Talk about the bid ask. Uh, yeah, again, this is another uh, you know problem we're seeing in our day to day job here is uh, the difference between uh, buyer and seller's expectations of value. You know, when you've heard for the last five years that their value continues to go up uh, as interest rates fall and cap rates fall, it's hard to stomach the realization that. Um, Values are now down 20 to 25 percent across the board simply because of uh, interest rates. I mean, you can't, you know, buy a property at a four cap when interest rates are now six and a half. And so, I, you know, again, back to the uh, reason why transactions have fallen to the levels they are today is simply because of the discrepancy between buyer and seller's expectations of price. And then, yeah, and and I and I think you know the the institutional capital world is, is so uh, performance based, right? L l less focused on buying at the right basis and less total dollar profit, total dollar profit based, and and really benchmarked against each of their peer set. So there, there's a huge disadvantage to the institutional market jumping back into the market too soon because the the, the way that they're measured basis point by basis point on IRR. So th this isn't this is sentiment where you have. You know, investors believing, you know, that, that the market's going to, they're, they're expecting it to get slightly better, right? You, you, you saw people, uh, if you ask them today versus one year ago, nearly everybody says values are, are, are way down. Like there, there's a few people, 1% of the population out there somewhere, uh, figures are higher. I'm not sure who, uh, but, but that's that's the little part of the chart there. Um, but, I mean, but, those but, people. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but one year from now, right, like 71% of people but believe that values are going to be about the same or somewhat lower. So if you're IRR based, right, and not necessarily, again, kind of per pound based or, or total dollar profit based, you're totally incentivized to just wait to, to, to you know, not start the clock too soon on your money. Next slide. Uh, and, and these these are just some uh, some takeaways. So I, I think we we sort of addressed these in the slide, and, and happy to, to follow up uh, with any questions. Uh, and we'll yep. see some. Please reach out to Chris or I if you want to get into more detail here, and we don't want to take the whole time just jabbering. And so, um, probably a good time to jump into some of these questions just so we can get into more of the meat. Yeah, exactly. And thank you guys for giving us the sort of just all the dirt stats that are just stuff that I think, frankly, I had no idea on, and and most of our our audience wouldn't have just have that readily available. And I think it's important for people to know that if you ever need or have interest in some of the stats, Cushman and Wakefield spend a lot of time on this stuff. So if there's other 
interesting data points you'd like to have, go ahead and reach out to these guys. Getting into sort of the practical aspects of what's going on on the ground right now, maybe you guys could walk us through sort of what the, and it probably more directed at Chris than than Tim, but uh, what the underwriting metrics are looking like in terms of cap rates, unlevered and levered IRRs, exit cap rates, and and what the reality is on the ground. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll talk about the 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 kind of more capital markets. Then Tim can probably talk about the the buyer markets. So, because that's where that's where a lot of this disconnect actually is right now. Because there's a lot of buyers out there bidding on deals because they have their view. You know, they're they're close to the market. They have their view on the numbers, and then you have a bunch of big institutional investors that have pool money from from pension funds and stuff that are they're looking at things more from a macro standpoint, right? So 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 the the the, the way that the the yields are they're looking at is negative leverage is like a huge no-no in, in kind of um, you, you know large fund world, right? Because you have this drag on your capital. So that's, so that's when your debt cost is higher than your cap rate. So debt costs, we, we've seen, you know, treasury is down 65 basis points in the last month. Um, so everybody's kind of high-fiving each other. We're still sitting at like four, three, five today. We were down at four and a quarter. But what, what that means is now you can transact with debt in the 575 to 6% range is where we're seeing a lot of 10-year fixed rate debt with a couple of years of interest only. So it, it, that, that means that it feels better to buy a property uh, in, in the high fives caps. And, and what institutional equity will largely say is they're, they're looking for kind of to have that neutral leverage, not necessarily day one, like if there's like a light value ad plan or some lost to lease that wasn't the rent roll. Now, we have this gain to, to gain to lease situation we're talking about now, but take that aside for a second. If you can get there sort of within like one to two years, they'll lean in on it. So, so it's made it more viable where we're, institutional investors were saying, hey, we, we need a cap rate that's in the sixes, like high fives to sixes, you know, just a month ago to, to kind of now being back in, in a realm now where like we've had, I've had three calls today from groups that are going back and taking bids at deals again, right, that they walked away from at, at sort of new pricing that, that works with the, the, with the current debt markets. So, you know, it, it's really sort of allowing buyers to now talk about general cap rates sort of in that like low fives ranges to where they would bid, you know, run the mill deal. You have, you have you have really irreplaceable trophy assets, and and this is kind of when I hand over to Tim that you can still talk about stuff in the fours if there's a compelling reason. Uh, but 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 you know, institutional capital is really looking at that you know kind of neutral leverage uh, on the underwriting side. Yeah, I think you, um, that's where we spent ten years talking about value and how much it's gone up and where rent growth's going and how you can push the value and where it's going to be in two years. You know, we 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 go into every discussion with a seller today, starting with the debt and then solving backwards. And essentially, the goal of our of us our role at this point when selling a property is how many years can a buyer stomach of negative leverage, and then what is the path to growth? But we're starting with the debt, saying this is what you have to overcome. I mean, most markets still have strong fundamentals. Maybe not today, but the, but the path forward with rent growth and in migration to most markets is still really strong. So how do you get to break even leverage, and then how do you uh, push that you know down the road? And so that's where again we spent so long just talking about growth and rent growth and value growth, you know, which was all based on debt anyway. But we didn't spend time talking about the debt. Now we're focused on the debt. Um, again, we're we're still pitching deals. We've had four this week. Uh, large institutions, some distressed, some looking for opportunities, some just wanting to know what their value is worth today. Uh, but, you know, we're coming in anywhere from a low five to a high five, depending on location, depending on, you know, how how, how strong they are in rents today, depending on the perception of the market and the, and the uh, ability to grow, uh, you know, over the next two to three years. I mean, I do think we can point to significant rent growth, uh, 20, 2025, 2026, 2027, because we will have a significant lack of supply coming on the market. But how long can you stomach negative leverage until you get to that point? And can you just bet on that rent growth to get you out of negative leverage? And most groups are saying, no, I'm not going to bet on that. That's going to be my icing on the cake. That's what's going to push my value up above what I'm buying at today. So that segues into a discussion about sort of what debt looks like right now. Um, is it options for lo from loan agencies, insurance companies, banks, debt funds? What are we primarily looking at these days? Yeah, and as I'll address that, but just a technical question first. I, I, I know that the slide screen is still up. Yeah. So Maybe are we little just... people or are we big people? Because it'd be better if people could see our faces and see if see how genuine we're being versus versus. Yeah, uh, maybe Joe Bell can switch it over to the in the view options to the bigger picture, so we're not little uh, minions. So we'll just keep talking, and Joe Bell, if you can figure out how to make 
Chris look bigger. Oh, there we go. Okay. Chris, Chris showered today. So he wants to uh, make sure people know. <laughs> I put on a clean shirt. I showered. <laughs> tell, tell his girlfriend. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so debt markets today. So, so starting with agency, which I was touching a little bit earlier, agency has been, you know, is, is the most efficient for a lot of the, the multifamily market, right? And, or, or, for vanilla, more vanilla financing, right? So, so agencies are, are giving you 60% debt today, depending on cap rate. And, and that's sort of in the, you know, uh, high five, you know, 575 to low sixes coupon, 10 years of interest only, um, you know, it, it, doing what the agencies are supposed to do, so, so supporting housing in this country. Um, moving into the life company market, there, there's a pretty compelling uh, life company, higher leverage option that's come in in the last few years. Um, a number of the big uh, uh, REITs and private equity firms, Apollo, KKR, Blackstone, they, they've all bought or, or done um, separate account, separate management agreements, separate account management agreements, or, they, or they, they've made investments in their insurance companies so that they can control the flow of insurance capital into uh, commercial real estate. So what, what they have is they have a different program where they're lending, you know, that they're, the insurance industry is made up of a whole bunch of different insurance companies that have different risk tolerances because they're private equity firms they are going into the more high yield sector there. So where Northwestern Mutual will still bid, you know, bid a, a deal at Treasuries plus 150 today for a borrower they like on a really core multifamily property, but they're going to be 50, 55% leverage maybe at the lower end of the spectrum. Uh, the, the, the private equity firms will actually push into more in the high 60s. Uh, they're, they're sort of solving for like a, an 8% type exit debt yield to their position. So you, so you can really sort of push the leverage with them. And they have a product that's in the, the like the low 200. So they're sort of in the 225, 240 range. So you can get a coupon that feels high. I mean, it's at 675 today. It's, it's expensive money. But they'll, they'll give you like a three-year term on it, so so they'll allow you more flexible prepay that you know everybody's expecting the market to come back down. So so that that's helped uh, options for for pushing leverage uh, with with fixed income, you know, life company type money. I think life companies, most life companies are in that sort of upper one hundred range. They'll give you that fifty-five to sixty percent range. Uh, construction is where we've had to get like really super creative, um, and, and, and it's hard to build right now. So with the ec public, ec public, ec not public equity markets, but institutional equity markets, very challenging to get capital out of today for construction. It's mostly groups that have the equity already in hand that they can go ahead and start projects. So we, we've, we've had to get pretty creative uh, in, in solutions for doing those because the banks, uh, are not in the best shape they've been in. Not not quite as bad as 2008, but they're not that strong right now. So so they're having problems. And that's getting... mostly balance sheet driven, right? Because they've yeah. already got so many. They've got capital deployed that is either in default or going to be or out of balance, or, or they're not getting repaid on stuff, or they're, <laughs> they've taken their beats on their treasury book exposure. A whole bunch of issues the banks have, mm -hmm. right? They, so it's so like capital is very important to them. They like deposits. Like, if, and not to say I have I have seen term sheets as high as sixty percent recently from banks and like the low two uh, high two hundreds low three hundreds because of some relationship that drives that so I can't say it's not out there, but like most options for bank financing are in the high forties percent leverage today, and it's sort of three hundreds pricing. So so now you're talking about a coupon that's approaching nine percent for for less than fifty percent leverage, which gets like really hard to make deals pencil right. Absolutely, and so. Okay. Keep going. Keep going. So, 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 so the, so the, so where there's a lot of liquidity is away from the banks, uh, which is in the debt fund world, and because they're using back leverage. So, so one of the problems the banks are having is is that the Feds have come in and, and kind of hit them harder as it relates to the way that they have to reserve and 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 capital account for dollars associated with uh, commercial real estate loans. So a lot of the big banks, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, Barclays, uh, you name it, uh, they're they're actually focusing more on their note on note or repo financing because they actually get much better capital treatment for it. So they much rather lend it to a debt fund that is going to then lend it to a borrower, and it actually is cheaper for them than if they just lend it to the borrower to give that leverage to another mm -hmm. lender. So so where the debt funds are is they're sort of pushing leverage up to seventy five to eighty percent. And and their their cost of capital though it's expensive it, it it's so for five fifty, um, which now you're talking about like a, a nearly an eleven ish percent coupon. But mm -hmm. when you think about a lot of construction deals that are twenty four months and then the draw schedule and dollars not getting funded until month eight or ten anyway, like the money's actually not out that outstanding that long. It doesn't really break the model. You just have to feel good as a developer if you have that twenty or twenty five percent equity about being able to repay that loan 
uh, when it matures, if you, if you want to repay it or if you just want to sell the asset, right? Just depends on your strategy. So, so a yeah. lot of developers are taking that leverage. The, the other two secrets that we use, and I know this is being recorded, so I don't know if I'm going to get all secrets, but I'll get them out. So, so, so <laughs> there are two secrets we're doing. We're, we're, we're doing a couple of deals where we're doing um, construction to perm financing, which you have to ask who's crazy enough to take uh, expensive money long term in, in a market like this, right? But, but if you're building deals to low yield on cost, right? We, have, we still have some deals that were capitalized with equity in the high fours to low fives yield on cost, where a lot of the market wants in the sixes to 7% today with, with where cap rates are at. You, you can capitalize those deals with debt on a construction firm basis because the, the lenders believe the value is going to be there in 15 years. It's very hard to peg where the value is going to be at in three years, right? Which is why you have to be really comfortable if you're taking 75 to 80% leverage where value is going to be at in three years. But if you're taking 15-year money, you feel very good about the debt that you're taking on. You, you just have to make sure that you're capitalizing the deal in such a way that you can do that, right? So it's usually it's usually private capital, high net worths, pension funds, life companies that are willing to build under that precedent. Like the deal works, like let's just put it away and forget about it, right? Mm. Long-term money, other, yeah. Yeah, the, the other thing is, is C-PACE. Um, which is, um, I'm not giving, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not giving legal advice, but I'm using legal terms. I don't understand. It, it's, it's effectively a tax lien. It's, it's a tax assessment tax lien. Um, and, and the market's like super efficient. You can basically borrow 30 year money at sort of like seven and a half to 8% fixed. So you're arbitraging the fact that the treasury rates are, are lower than so for today. And the money is, has pretty flexible prepay with fees after year three. So you can get about 40% leverage sort of at that cost of capital. Um, it's just the way, it's just the rules and, and regulations around the way that C-PACE is, is sized. And there's three states that works really great in Washington, California, and Florida, because C-PACE is, is effectively green, associated with green bonds, green green uh, nature of projects. So uh, one, of the, one of the elements of the green calculation is resiliency. And because of uh, all the wonderful seismic risk that, that uh, sit in the Puget Sound region, um, like the, the effectively the entire superstructure and foundation of most buildings gets accounted for as, as part of a green improvement. So, so you can get a lot of credit and a lot of benefit there. So we have a couple of deals where we're using that uh, either to uh, get the transact, like get a construction deal done. You can also get, you can do that up to three years post uh, certificate of occupancy. Um, so, so you can, you can re like uh, if you've had budget buff, you can come in and use that to right size the budget. Uh, we've been using it for um, uh, a whole slew of different kind of fi fixing problems, right? Both well, fixing problems and using it resourcefully to start construction, I think is what. And, and fair to say that the CPACE is, is still fairly a new program, right? So on a, on a spectrum analysis of one to 10, we're at like stage two of that because it hasn't been, now it's getting used, you know, and actually coming into fruition and deals are happening uh, was it like two or three years ago, people would talk about CPACE, but deals hadn't really transpired enough to look around and go like, oh, they, you know, it's actually, they're, they're, they're being processed and actually getting to the finish line. Yeah, well, so so, so I, I, right before I, I hopped on, and the, and the banks have been reluctant because it's in the early infancy of, of like, I'm gonna not going to take on a, a new form mm -hmm. of capital if I don't understand it. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I just got the phone with a, with a deal that closed today that was Wells Fargo. Uh, had an apartment project that uh, there was a, um, and I use Wells because it, it, they're, they're obviously an important brand to have bought on to using CPACE. Uh, Wells had an apartment project where there was a budget bust and the developer came and as, as a means of right-sizing the, the budget, they they allowed them to bring CPACE in uh, to, to solve that issue. Yeah, and I suspect that's going to become a lot more common as it becomes more accepted uh, in the industry and the banking sector in general. Um which is kind of what happens with these these formats. Uh, so uh, you mentioned a few things on creativity, wondering if there's anything else to add to that. I think the three-year term is very interesting. I think people, lenders staying on to take a second, which is unusual, but being seen more often because otherwise they're not cashing out the portion that they would like to see. Maybe they're staying in a little longer. Um, any other methods of creativity that you're seeing out there? And it's okay if you say, oh, I've just covered them. <laughs> and Tim, Tim's been doing, being creative on the sales side. Do you want to talk about some of the stuff you've been yeah, doing? Yeah, that'd be great. Well, well, I think part of that is the debt too. And I think it, not talking about institutional size deals, but we do a handful of, you know, call it five to $25 million deals a year. And as you talk about some of the, you know, credit crises the banks have right now, there are a lot of local regional banks that if you're doing a core deal in their market or close to their market, they're willing to give you a pretty good loan. We're selling a building up in Ballard right now uh, that there was a, you know, a Washington-based bank who wanted to lend on it. 
they wanted you to bring some deposits over and put some deposits into their bank to give you give you a loan, but it actually was better rate and terms than you could get and more flexible prepay than you could get from Fannie or Freddie today. And so size-wise, you're not going to get the proceeds as you get into bigger deals, but I think um, uh, exhausting options with banks and credit unions, credit unions have come and come back into the market a little bit too. And if you're willing to to put some funds there, keep some deposits at the bank, they're willing to get, get creative with you. And so that's, that's a, you know, again, it all kind of comes back to debt right now. And so yeah. like most of the creativity we're seeing is on debt because you can't. And I would, I, I would, I would just echo that, you know, when we have these deals that are uh, fairly small, say sub 10 million, you know, and these interest rates creep up, your sellers are looking at placing 1031s and stuff and also looking at maybe we'll just do some seller financing here because this interest rate's not that bad for at least a portion of it. And maybe then they 1031 the rest on the longer term holds, if that's a possibility. Obviously, that's heavily limited by how levered they are. So most of that is happening where assets have been in the family forever and they're debt free or unlevered or under levered. Uh, but we are seeing a serious increase in seller financing um, deals for sure. And some of them yeah, are just, I mean, they're told on the way in, like you can try and sell this asset, but the only way you're going to move it due to that asset size class is, is with, is with seller financing. We, we had a conversation with a seller who's selling a portfolio here in Seattle uh, two weeks ago that we told her it was worth probably 30 to 35 million, but if she wanted to carry debt on it, it was worth over 40. Right. You don't have right. There's a pricing, there. there's a pricing arbitrage there for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to jump through the hoops. You don't have to pay all the fees that are associated with it. And the rate doesn't have to be that, that different, but a, flex, a flexible prepay and a little bit more leverage is going to go a long way. So we are so, seeing a, a, a yeah. seller financing. And, and, you know, I, I would say that you could do the same thing with your banker. I, 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 I think good advice um, is, is if you have, if you have a loan that you, if you need new money, you should call your bank and say, hey, I need this loan on this new deal. And your banker is going to tell you, I'd really like to give it to you, but we don't really have, you know, we're not doing new lending right now, right? And then if you have a loan that you can repay them on, you can call up your banker and say, listen, I'm repaying you on a loan that I have with you. I need you to relend me that money, right? He, they can't really say no, because you're, you're giving them the money back. And so your lender is a little captive. So we've had a number of deals where we've done that, where the, the, the lenders have been like, we're only paying you back if you write us a new loan. Otherwise, we're not incentivized to, to actually do a deal right now, right? And and in a lot of cases, it's a lot of them put a new origination on the book. You know, they, they can show it as a repayment. It's they're, they're usually open to a warm reception for the discussion. So I think we'll close on, unless I see questions in the chat, a fun one that I think, you know, is on a lot of people's minds and I get asked all the time. So I'll let the, the pros from Dover uh, respond. Uh, so the frequently asked question would be something like, my loan is coming due and I can't refinance, what is my lender going to do if I can't repay? <laughs> Did you want to answer first? <laughs> yeah, what's your answer? <laughs> well, I mean, what we've been seeing is banks don't want to own property. Uh, we're not at the point where it works. Uh, and from an IRR perspective, I think they're not telling me what the metrics are, but you know, um, they're, the, banks and investors are not real estate development folks or management companies. So they're not really set up for that. And everybody knows it. So at the moment, it feels like the owners have a little bit of leverage. There's a point where that shifts and where that shifts is, as you guys were mentioning earlier, you get to a certain IRR where it's like over a 10 year period, this isn't going to, you know, this isn't going to work where we'd be better off collecting, you know, 60, 70 cents on the dollar and redeploying elsewhere than waiting for this. Cause we're never going to get there right on a value proposition. So um, right now it's, you know, extend, talk about different options for modification. I don't know how much longer the runway is on that. So I'm actually interested to hear what you guys think about where we're at on that runway. Yeah. I, I, I just uh, well, saw the participant count went down by one. So I think we have to say something super interesting to see if we can get this on like YouTube or something. <laughs> well, we're, <laughs> we're going to try to wrap up in, in three minutes so that we keep this under 40 minutes. So <laughs> uh, I'll say the first thing we do is Chris and I put our heads together and we start talking about what the options are. Right. And this is a conversation that provides whatever, whoever the owner is, the developer, the existing owner of what their options are. And we're running concurrent paths for sales and refinances or recaps at the same time, I don't know, on a handful of stuff right now. And we'll come back to you with all the options available to you. And you're right. There are a lot of lenders who don't want to take it back, but those same lenders are calling people like me on a regular basis saying, what can you sell this for right now? And they're going to look at what their debt is. And if the developer is not working with them or not, I mean, the best thing you can do as a developer or an owner is be as cooperative and communicative with the bank as possible. 
and and show them that you're trying to find your way out of it. But at the end of the day, if a bank's not getting repaid and they're accruing uh, losses on their end and their option is I can sell it, take a loss, or even more so if I can sell it and get all my money back, they're going to start the foreclosure proceeding. I mean, they're not going to let a developer kick the can down the road, not pay too long. And especially if they, if the bank can get paid back, if they have control and can force that payment, they're going to eventually do it because uh, we don't know what's going to happen next year where I think we're all a little bit optimistic, but if it gets worse and they can get their money out now, they don't want to find out what the future holds. I, I think you have to put this in the category of, of, of most things in life where you want something from somebody, right? So, so you sort of have to put your, put you yourself in their shoes, right? And be like, what, what, how would I behave? Right. And how would I react? And what would I expect somebody to do? Right. And, and, and I think what you have to say, like you're sitting there as a lender, right? You're, you're, you're trying to keep the credit of the book healthy and you're trying to keep capital flows and everything else. Right. So, and, and, and you want to see that the person that's coming to you actually has done their work and is prepared, right? Because if, if you're just sending a letter saying, uh, hey, I'd like an extension, I'm not willing to do anything. Like, if you got that letter, you'd be like, what? <laughs> like, what? Why am I supposed to even consider this proposal, right? But if, if the person actually puts work into it and, and has like a couple debt bids and has a couple sale bids and they come to you with this pack and say, listen, I tried to sell it. I can't sell it at a reasonable. Or if, or if I could sell it, here's the numbers, right? And it doesn't make sense for either of us to sell it, right? I, I, I can't do this financing today because this financing doesn't work, right? The, the lender is much more open to having a conversation at that point. That's what Tim was saying, where we run all these processes because you're actually coming to them with, with data and information they can put in their memo and they can say, listen, that, that we can make this modification because you're hundred percent right. And, and, and you wanna be forthcoming and, and right with the information you're sharing with them, right? The, the other thing, and I think that goes hand in hand with that, and this, this is this is a I didn't, I didn't mean for the commercial to come at the end, but this is the commercial part. You have to have competent advisors, both brokers and attorneys involved in these transactions, because you, you can't be negotiating with these parties with, without having all the information and, and, and making sure, especially on the legal side, that, that, that it's getting documented appropriately and to market terms at the time. Right. Because there's a lot gets lost in the documentation process of the term process. So that's why. You, you know, having the brokers and attorneys that are used to, you know, these types of points and negotiating these types of points, I think is highly critical to these, you know, modifications and extensions. Yeah, I'd echo the sentiment about uh, continuing good faith and, you know, communicating openly, honestly, right away. If I'm frequently on the lender side. We do a lot of finance work for um, primarily local lenders. Um, it's incredibly difficult to regain good faith and goodwill if you've been radio silent for a while or if any information you've provided as a borrower uh, is wrong or off or just everyone knows that that's not even possible. Uh, once the lever is ticked on the lender side to go forward with enforcement, it is frequently uh, you're, you're, you're beyond repair. You're going down that trail and it's go until it's sold. Uh, and there's really little that you can do after that point. And so when we are seeing a number of foreclosures, we're not anywhere near where I think it will get, unfortunately, not to be a downer on the way out. Um, but we are seeing an increase in, in enforcement. And I think it's becoming, you know, very apparent that there are advisors out there that know what they're talking about. Like you guys, thank you very much for being a resource for our firm and our clients. Uh, but you do need to have a look at what's going on and you need to be at the plate with your team rather than saying, yeah, we're trying to work on it. Um, and that just shows the lender that you're working on it effectively. You're willing to uh, put your money where your mouth is and step to step up to make real, real concessions and real and a real effort to get something done. So with that, there's so much more to talk about on this front. If you have questions or need answers or, or anything, all of our contact information is available. This recording uh, link to this will come in your e email. Feel free to forward it and share um, and reach out to uh, Tim and Chris. Uh, or us if you have questions. Thank you so much, Tim and Chris, for sharing um, and taking the time to do this. And um, we'll see you out there in the marketplace. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it.